Timothy Patrick McNamara was born on December 10, 1948, and would later have a son and daughter named Jennifer Ralston Clark and Caleb McNamara. In 2012, Mac, as he was known by, was a hardworking farm operator now in his 60s. He would strike up a relationship with 40-year-old Tracy Nessel. Mac loved his family, raised his children, and built a legacy on his 84-acre apple orchard. He was also going through his third divorce in July 2012 when he met Nestle, who was living in North Carolina but was visiting her grandparents in Soap Lake, Washington. But here's the crazy part. Nestle was actually the biological daughter of Mac's brother, making her his niece, although her father was never in her life. The couple would keep this fact a secret from the people that didn't know. Nessel said she didn't care that Mac was her biological uncle and didn't know the McNamaras very well, but said that she and Mac's souls were connected. Nessel said that as a child, she was never accepted by the McNamaras because she was an illegitimate child who was rejected by her father. Just months into the relationship, Mac began dating Nessel over a million dollars worth of property, paid off all of her debts on her former home in Hope Mills, North Carolina, named her on his life insurance policy, and made her the sole beneficiary in his will. A year later, believing family and friends would never accept their romantic relationship, Nessel and Mac left Washington State in early 2013 and moved to Belize to begin a new life together. Mac leased out his Soap Lake farm, and with a $240,000 insurance payout he received from a failed crop, he bought a new farm in Belize. The couple then began building a bed and breakfast on the property located in Boston Village off the old Northern Highway and then got married. Nestle said Mac insisted on the marriage and wanted her to have his last name. By 2014, a year or so into their marriage, the couple's relationship had soured and Mac discovered that Nestle had had an affair. According to the family, Mac had begun to distrust his wife. He expressed concern over his safety Nestle's faithfulness and his decision to pass his entire estate to her. In October 2014, Nestle purchased a 9mm pistol in North Carolina and had it shipped to Belize and licensed the firearm on December 2nd of that year. Meanwhile, Mac and his children began exchanging emails again. In one of them, Caleb suggested his father consider selling the Soap Lake farm to alleviate the financial pressure, but he rejected the idea. In fact, Mac had quit claim the property to Nestle in December 2012, shortly after their romance began. On Christmas Day 2014, just days before his life insurance was set to expire, 66-year-old Mac was found on their home's porch by Nestle, dead of a gunshot wound to the back of the head. Nestle claims that when she found him, he was on his side, so she laid down next to him and began spooning him with a blanket over both of them to keep him warm. The death was originally called a suicide, but then, Nestle claims, the lead officer of the Belizean police told her Mac owed him money, and when she declined to pay him, the case was turned into a homicide. Some reports state that Nestle claimed Mac walked outside with the gun, as he usually did in case he encountered an animal, and she soon heard a gunshot. Other reports state that she told police that she and her husband had a misunderstanding over money, and when she left him outside, he took his own life. But the locals and investigators disagreed. Orlando Vera, a forensics analyst at the National Forensic Service, found that the absence of scratches and damage to both the front and rear sights of the weapon indicates that the firearm did not fall from a height, but was rather placed where it was found. Vera also found that blood on the front, back, and top of the right sleeve of the blouse that Nessa was wearing indicated that the blouse was close at the time he was shot. Pictures taken and analyzed by Robert Henry, crime scene specialist, on the night of Mac's death revealed that no blood was seen on the hands of the victim, indicating that his hands were never holding the firearm. Blood on the back of his shirt and the gun indicated a blowback effect. Henry concluded that Mac was not the one who fired the shot from the 9mm that Nestle purchased a few weeks earlier. He said that Mac was in a standing position at the time of the shooting and that the gun may have been placed in the area it was found at the time the scene was being processed. 
John Rudon, forensic analyst attached to the firearm unit, documented a post-mortem examination on Mac. He concluded that the position of the entry wound would be extremely uncomfortable for the victim to have fired himself. He also said the trajectory of the bullet and a lack of gunpowder on Mac's hands proved he didn't shoot himself. By the time Nestle became an official suspect, she had already left the country and returned to Soap Lake, Washington, two days after the incident. After the murder, Belize police put out a warrant for Nestle's arrest, but could not pursue the matter any further, since it required the U.S. to allow for extradition and the FBI had no jurisdiction. She has never been extradited in this case. This led Mac's children to file a civil murder suit in Washington in 2015, claiming that Nestle had seduced, murdered, and deceived their father for financial gain. They filed the lawsuit under Washington Slayer Statute, which states that a person may not benefit from a property if they had killed a person to get it. It would be 10 years before trial would begin, accusing Tracy of murdering her husband. Mac's daughter, Jennifer, traveled to Belize multiple times to obtain evidence from authorities. The trial began on March 7, 2022, and the jury announced its verdict in favor of criminal murder by the defendant, Tracy Nessel, but she would remain a free woman. Although the couple got married in Belize, the marriage was later voided when the government learned of the couple's biological relationship. In the end, she was found civilly liable for his death, and the jury awarded Mac's adult children $3.3 million in damages to be paid by Nestle on the conclusion that she had willfully committed battery against their father and caused his death. So, while Nestle remains a free woman, she must pay the family every dollar they say she had taken from their father. Haley Darlene Dunn was born on August 28, 1997, and lived in Colorado City, Texas. Her parents separated when she was 10 years old, and she and her brother David went to live with their mother, Billy, and her mother's boyfriend, Sean Atkins, on Chestnut Street in Colorado City. Haley and her dad, Clint Dunn, were especially close, and since Clint lived only a short walk away from where Haley lived, she would visit his house every day. At the age of 13, she was an 8th grader at Colorado Middle School where she was involved in basketball, softball, volleyball, and cheerleading and played the saxophone in the band. Her father described her as lovable, bubbly, caring, and a tomboy who liked pretty things. On December 26, 2010, Haley's brother spent the night with a friend, and Haley stayed home playing video games until midnight. Early the next morning, Atkins and Billy left for work, leaving Haley asleep in her bed. Atkins would arrive at his job at around 6 a.m. He would then get into an argument with his boss and then quit his job soon after. Atkins would pick Billy up from work that evening, and when they arrived back at the house, Haley was not home. Atkins told her that his boss had fired him that morning. He said that when he arrived home at 3 p.m., he spoke with Haley, who said she was heading to her father's house, and then to her friend Mary Beth's home for a sleepover, and would be back the next day. Billy took Adkins at his word and carried on with her evening as normal. By the next afternoon, when Haley had not returned, her mother called Mary Beth's home. To Billy's surprise, they had no knowledge of Haley having any plans to stay the previous night. She also found out that Haley had never visited her father either. Billy found Haley's toothbrush and clothes still in the home, items you would have most likely taken with you for a sleepover. Billy then reported her daughter missing. Haley's father, Clint, became relentless in trying to find his daughter, but as the search for Haley progressed, the reporters and locals noticed that Billy wasn't participating. Shockingly, just four days after Haley was reported missing, Adkins and Billy threw a New Year's Eve party. However, Billy would say that she didn't realize it was New Year's Eve and that the family had just come over to support her. It soon became apparent that Haley and her brother's home lives were way more difficult behind closed doors than anyone realized. Billy and Adkins had a toxic relationship. Haley's grandmother told the media that Haley was terrified of Adkins. 
She said he was creepy and would stand in the doorway of her room at night and watch her. An affidavit would say that Adkins had previously threatened Billy and Haley's life in February of 2010. It also came to light that Adkins had not been fired from his job after all. According to his boss, he arrived at work at 6 a.m. on December 27th, purchased a Dr. Pepper, handed in his overalls, and quit within 10 minutes of arriving. He claimed that after leaving work, he went straight to his mother's house in Big Spring and applied for unemployment benefits on her computer. He claimed to have driven home at 2.40 p.m., but his cell phone data revealed otherwise. Cell phone pings placed him in Colorado City between 6.35 and 6.56 a.m. and in Big Spring from 9.38 a.m. to 2.40 p.m., 30 miles from home. Her father, Clint, would join forces with a private investigator in August 2018. In a 2011 television interview, Atkins denied involvement in Haley's disappearance and described the day she went missing. He said he drove to work, quit his job, turned in his belongings, and didn't speak to anyone at work. He said he drove to his mother's house where he researched online to see if he could qualify for unemployment and then went home that afternoon at about 3 p.m. He claimed that when he arrived home, Haley was watching TV in the living room, and so he went to the bedroom he shared with Billy. He said that she came in there, told him she was going to her father's house, and then would be staying the night with a friend, and then she left. He said about an hour later, Billy's son David and a friend came home, went to David's room, and played video games. He then went to pick up Billy from work at the Snyder Hospital at 6 p.m., and the couple returned home and then went to bed shortly after that. He begged Haley to come home during the televised interview and said he had nothing to do with her disappearance and loved her. Both Billy and Atkins would later fail a lie detector test regarding Haley's whereabouts. Authorities and community members searched landfills, fields, and wooded areas, but they were never able to find any signs of Haley. Over two years later, on March 16, 2013, Haley's body was found by someone rock hunting on property owned by the Atkins family in Scurry County near Lake J.B. Thomas, about 30 miles from their home. It would be nearly six weeks before the remains were officially identified as belonging to Haley, and it would be almost four years before she could finally be laid to rest after being released to her mother. Seven years later, in 2020, Haley's biological father had undergone so much stress regarding his daughter's murder that he began to have heart attacks. He was also stalked and harassed by a man, was threatened numerous times, and was unfairly treated by people, including local law enforcement in Big Springs, Texas, who allegedly tried to cover up and protect Adkins. At some point, the FBI took over the case from the local police The home she disappeared from was demolished for unknown reasons, and the couple moved to Austin, Texas, but have since broken up. Then, in 2021, nearly 11 years after her murder, Atkins was finally arrested by Texas Rangers and indicted on murder and tampering with evidence by intentionally and knowingly concealing a human corpse. The indictments came down on December 30, 2021, and show he is accused of striking Haley in the head with an unknown object, causing her death on December 26, 2010, the day before she had supposedly left the home. While it was reported that a DNA sample led to the arrest, authorities have remained tight-lipped about any other details in the case. Witness accounts would say that Atkins was fascinated by horror slasher films, and it is reported that he is a collector of movie memorabilia, connected to the Halloween movie series. During the investigation, authorities confiscated 278 pages of material printed off a computer about several lurid topics the couple described as a hobby. Officers found the materials in a box in the bedroom shared by Billy and Atkins, which was printed at their jobs. The material included 23 pages related to serial killer Edmund Kemp, 18 pages were related to George Emil Banks, who killed five of his own children and went on a broader killing spree. Another 13 pages were printed about Robert Leroy Anderson, a serial killer and sadist. 
37 pages were related to Robert Picton, a Canadian pig farmer, about mass murder, and as many as 23 missing Vancouver women. Other material in the box included a photo of a pentagram and information about vampires and the occult. 15 pages were related to Alton Coleman and Deborah Brown, a pair of killers in which Brown was painted as a good girl gone bad and incorporated crude topics. Another 19 pages printed on the same day were related to the princes in the tower, the Henry VIII murders, and the murder of family members who were pre-pubertal and premeditated suffocation in bed. Other material included multiple pages associated with the rap group Insane Clown Posse. Allegedly, they also found in their possession were homemade explicit videos. Additionally, authorities discovered over 100,000 inappropriate pictures of minors and animals on a memory stick in Billy's home and a computer in Atkins' mother's house. It appeared clear to authorities that Atkins and Billy were fixated on slasher movies and obsessed with serial killers. One of Haley's uncles told police that after she disappeared, he asked Atkins how anyone could hurt a teenager, to which Atkins responded, it's like killing a deer. Before Billy and Atkins split, Haley's brother David was removed from the home by Child Protective Services. Three months later, authorities arrived at their house with the arrest warrant for Atkins, but Billy claimed he wasn't there. Upon searching the home, they found Atkins hiding, and Billy was sentenced to a year of probation for lying. Clint believes his ex-wife and Atkins were both responsible for his daughter's murder. Atkins also has a history of stalking multiple women and sexually assaulting at least two in Texas, Oklahoma, and New Mexico, where he spent some time. Since they were separated when Atkins was arrested, Billy said she didn't find out about the arrest from law enforcement, but instead from the internet and was happy about the outcome. She said, I'm not really shocked at the news that it was Sean. Of course, you would have hoped it wasn't him because I stayed with him after she left, after Haley went missing but I'm not surprised, and I thank God that person has been apprehended and will pay for what he did here on Earth. Billy admitted they both failed lie detector tests, but said any allegations that she knew what happened to her daughter were absolutely false. Karen Swift was a 1985 graduate of Walnut Ridge High School in Walnut Ridge, Arkansas. She would later become a mother of four and lived with her family in Dyersburg, Tennessee. Her close friends described her as a lot of fun, witty, and strong-willed, except for when it came to her husband, David Swift, who they said always told her what to do. In October 2011, 44-year-old Karen filed for divorce from David. The couple had a very tumultuous relationship and had both been known to step outside of the marriage. However, despite their unsteady past, there were never any known signs of domestic violence. Three weeks after the filing, on the night of October 29, 2011, Karen attended a Halloween party at the Farms Golf Club and left sometime after 1 a.m. to pick up her daughter, who wasn't feeling well, from another party. Upon arriving home, Karen lay down with her daughter for about 30 minutes before carrying her into her other daughter's room and leaving them in bed together. The oldest daughter remembers looking at the clock and seeing it was about 3 a.m. This was sadly the last time the girls would see their mother alive. The next morning, her 2004 Nissan Murano was found with a flat tire on the side of the road half a mile from her home. Nine weeks later, her remains were found by hunters underneath kudzu bushes in the Bledsoe Cemetery near her home, not far from where her car had been abandoned. The autopsy report states that Karen died of blunt force trauma to the head. She was also partially clothed and had other injuries at the time of her death. Initially, when Karen was considered missing, the Dyer County Sheriff's Department and the Tennessee Bureau of Investigations worked the case together but as soon as it became a homicide investigation, Dyer County took full jurisdiction over the case. Dyer County would claim that a lot of their time spent was dispelling false information and rumors with nothing leading to an arrest in Karen's murder. 
but witnesses who came forward with information have indicated that they attempted to give statements to the sheriff's department only for their eyewitness accounts to be downplayed or dismissed as false. However, Dyer County did release several statements to the public that pointed to David being the prime suspect. Allegedly, Karen had met a man who gave her 10 grand to help her leave her husband before she was murdered. At one point, some people were saying that Karen paid a high price for her extramarital affairs, and the detectives on the case seemed to want to turn a blind eye because some of the men were prominent figures in the community. Ultimately, 11 years after her murder, her husband, David Swift, was indicted of premeditated first-degree murder in the death of Karen. By that time, Swift had moved to Alabama and remarried, and was extradited back to Dyer County. However, as y'all know, small towns talk and rumors spiral out of control, and in the end, her divorce filings would be what led to her murder. Dr. Lee Big Twee was born in France and worked at the Hospital of Lyons before receiving a job at the National Institutes of Health in Maryland. After relocating to the States, she would change jobs and began working at the Children's Hospital in Washington, D.C. At the age of 42, Dr. T was a molecular research biologist living alone in a one-story home in the 1600 block of Martha Terrace in Rockford, Maryland. One of her projects at the medical center involved pediatric pulmonary medicine. Lee was well-liked and described as a wonderful, enthusiastic person. She was also a cello player who performed with the Montgomery College Symphony Orchestra. She was always deeply immersed in her work and was said to never take time off. In early October 1994, Lee exited the Twin Brook Metro Station and started her walk home. She sadly never made it because someone dragged her into a yard near her home and brutally attacked her. She was beaten and strangled to death. She had also been indecently assaulted and was not discovered for a few days because her body naturally sunk into some English ivy, making it very hard to see her. A leather satchel was found next to her body, ruling out robbery as a possible motive. DNA recovered from the crime scene would later lead detectives to her killer. In 2017, that DNA was sent in for DNA phenotyping, and it was determined that the suspect was white, likely with blue eyes and no freckles, and had a distinctive shape to his head. In 2018, images were released of how the man would have roughly appeared at ages 25 and 45. That DNA also linked to another case dating back to 1989, five years before Lee was killed, and involved a woman who was indecently assaulted after she, too, exited the Twin Brook station and headed home. On June 25, 1989, at about 10.15 p.m., a 52-year-old woman was walking on Lewis Avenue when a man approached her from behind, dragged her into a yard, and assaulted her. Five years later, on September 19, 1994, at about 10.20 p.m., a 25-year-old woman was walking on Twinbrook Parkway when a man approached her from behind, armed with a knife. He dragged her to the side of her residence and tried to assault her. She resisted, fled, and contacted the police. Investigators didn't have any DNA from this crime, but it still had the common denominator, a victim who had just left the station walking and attacked near her home. Parabon Nano Labs cross-referenced the DNA with DNA samples housed on the genealogy website, GEDmatch. Finally, in 2019, using genetic genealogy research, her killer was identified as Kenneth Earl Day. But Day died in 2017 at the age of 52 in Upshur County, West Virginia. Multiple mugshots were released of Day, showing he had a criminal history, but the nature of those crimes is unknown. He moved from Montgomery County around 1997, according to police, and worked as a carpenter in various areas of Maryland and West Virginia. Officials say Day could be a suspect in other unsolved cases in Montgomery County and believe he has likely attacked more women. Here are the prior known addresses for Kenneth Earl Day in Maryland, Virginia, and West Virginia with approximate dates. 
If a man attacked you in these areas from 1989 to the late 2000s, pause the screen and take a look. On August 11, 1994, 59-year-old Francisco Santoni arrived at the home he shared with his girlfriend, 28-year-old Concepcion Villa, who went by Connie and their three-year-old son, Dante Santoni. The home was located on Garden Gateway in El Paso, Texas. As Francisco entered the home, he was surprised to find an intruder in the hallway. The intruder immediately stabbed him and then fled the scene, taking with him some clothes, jewelry, and the family's 1994 Dodge Colt, which he had found in the garage. Francisco made his way to the bedroom where he would find Connie's body. The intruder had broken into their home sometime after midnight and had stabbed Connie and their son Dante. Sadly, all three victims would succumb to their injuries. Shortly after the killings, the family's car was found in El Paso, more than a dozen miles away from home. Investigators recovered evidence from the crime scene, but with limited technology, they couldn't develop any workable leads. Finally, in 2015, with advancements in technology, investigators were able to reopen the case and identify Arturo Ortega Garcia as a suspect. A warrant was then issued for his arrest, but it would take five years to capture him. In 2020, over 26 years after the triple homicide, U.S. Marshals and the Solitary Star Outlaw Team located and arrested 69-year-old Garcia in Mexico City. He was then extradited to the U.S. for arraignment and given a $5 million bond. Investigators have not disclosed the advancements that led to the suspect's identification, which I assume was genetic genealogy. They also haven't given a possible motive for the killings and what ties, if any, Garcia had to the family.